um, Millie. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, those joining from far away. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have Amr join us today. Uh, Amr is the section head of interventional cardiology at Cleveland Clinic uh, and the program director. Really prestigious institution and a prestigious position, but more so, Amr is one of the most wonderful people I've ever met and a very dear and close friend. I'm so glad you could take some time out of your busy day. I'm probably you got eight hours to do after this, but, <laughs> but I really appreciate you taking the time and spending some time with us so we can learn from you, Amr. Oh, it's absolutely uh, my pleasure, uh, Azim. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It, it truly is an honor. I know this is, a, uh, this is an important conference that you all uh, put on, not just in Monty, but uh, you know, it, I know it's received a lot of uh, attention just nationally and internationally for the content and the level of education that you all provide through this conference. So uh, truly, it's an honor for me to be a part of this really illustrious group. Um, you know, I, I think there's a while we've all been doing TAVI for a really long time, I think what's important to remember is that we can always be better in what we do. Uh, and in that regard, rather than view TAVI as sort of a commodity that just gets done, I think there are a lot of ways in which we can still make it better uh, and which we can sort of work on what we have done over the past decade or 15 years. And so what I'd like to do is just take a, a little bit of a step back, go through some of the data that we have uh, contributed to the literature in terms of, uh, of things to optimize TAVI, so to say. Um, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest. So how do we optimize TAVI in 2022? Uh, first, we want to minimize procedural risks. I'm going to focus specifically on these two, uh, new pacemaker implantation and stroke. Uh, how can we facilitate peripheral bailout? Because still, uh, no matter how good we are and how good the devices are, we're seeing peripheral complications at a rate of between 5 and 10%. I think it's really important um, to carefully consider the valve choice with regard to coronary access, hemodynamics, and future TAV and TAV capability. And I'll go through some case examples in this regard. Uh, we certainly all have our own favorite valves that we can default to, and that's probably fine for a number of patients, but I think a number of patients also benefit from a very careful valve choice. And then especially in the current era, as we were just discussing offline, trying to figure out ways to reduce the index hospital length of stay is going to be imperative in a time of really limited uh, resources. So to start with pacemaker implantation, this was a nice analysis from the TVT registry that <clears throat> the group in Columbia provided, uh, demonstrating that uh, while pacemaker rates are getting better in both the balloon expandable and self-expanding platforms, they are still higher. And in truth, on average, they're higher than surgical pacemaker rates. And this is something that we need to make better. Unfortunately, while there are a number of different risk factors, um, pre-ECG factors, et cetera, that contribute to post-TAV or pacemaker rates, very few of these are in fact modifiable. One of those few things that we can actually change is the depth of implantation and where exactly we put the valve in the annulus. And so in this regard, we actually looked at a, just over a thousand patients for whom we performed transfemoral TAVI in Cleveland Clinic between 2015 and 2018. 622 of them had the traditional deployment. This is how we all first learned to place the S3 valve with the middle balloon marker at the level of the annulus. What we did though was uh, subsequently, we started using a higher deployment technique in 406 patients. And what you see is that in the RAO caudal projection, we can isolate the non-coronary sinus. There's a straight flush catheter there. We know that the membrane is septum and the conduction tissue sits just beneath this. We then place the translucent line at the bottom of the S3 valve between the penultimate and the ultimate set of sense struts right at the level of the annulus. That's approximately the point to which the valve will foreshorten. Well, there were no differences in baseline conduction between these two groups, the old school and the new school group. And the clinical outcomes are no differences in AR degree, valve embolization, survival stroke, any of these things. What we did find though that on average, the high deployment technique resulted in a much higher level of deployment as was designed. And importantly, what we found was that on the left, you see a substantial reduction in pacemaker implantation from 13.1 to 5.5%. You also see a substantial reduction in the onset of new left bundle branch block um, in the high deployment group. 
Now, importantly, and I'm going to show a case example of this in a moment, we've been a bit more aggressive, actually, about how high we implant our valves, really trying to achieve almost a 100 uh, zero level of implantation. And if you look at the past three years, on the left is the balloon expandable valves, you see that we've achieved a pacemaker rate of around uh, 2% on average for the last uh, two years, over a total of almost 1,200 balloon expandable cases uh, and self-expanding cases, um, uh, similarly uh, a low, uh, low volume. <coughs> so to look at a case example here, um, this is a 72-year-old woman with a uh, baseline right bundle and uh, a left anterior fascicular block uh, pre-TAVR. So this is the kind of patient that we would all worry uh, right after TAVI would end up with complete heart block in the lab. If we look at the CT scan, uh, certainly a well-sized annulus for a 23 millimeter S3. Um, you can see adequate room in the sinuses, and I'm gonna specify in a moment why I'm uh, discussing this in such uh, detail. The coronary uh, to leaflet distance is a non-issue. The left coronary leaflet will fall below the left main trunk. And importantly, the sonotubular junction measures uh, well larger than a 23 millimeter S3. So no matter how high we implant this valve, between the room and the sinus and the size of the sonotubular junction, we won't sequester uh, the uh, sinuses for a future tab in tab when we make the, the LVOT essentially a tube from the, uh, with the valve. So how we set up for this high deployment technique, we place the valve in the annulus, and then we start in a pretty generic REO caudal view, let's say 2020. And then we just move the C-arm until we square off the valve. So if you watch this, you're gonna see the valve square off. We're just moving it off of the descending uh, catheter there. So this is how the valve started, not squared off. This is how we finished again in a, in a just a modified RAO caudal projection. So to be clear, we're not taking aerotographies, we're not planning the RAO caudal projection based on the pre-CT. It's literally just putting the valve in the annulus and then squaring it off. <clears throat> we then, as I showed you in the prior slide, we position, uh, we have got the straight flush in the non-coronary sinus. And you can see here, uh, the valve is actually positioned uh, quite aggressively. Here's a translucent line. So it's in fact, even higher than the base of the non-coronary sinus. Almost the valve itself is at, at, at that point. And then with the slow and controlled valve deployment, as you see here, you can just use a fine adjust knob, maybe lean on the valve a little just to try to be precise and kind of hit the, the base of the sinuses with the bottom of the valve, as you see there. So again, a very slow and controlled deployment. And with that, what you have here is a valve that's essentially at 100 and zero. It's a very high valve, minimal pacemaker risk. And as we analyze from the pre taver CT, what you see is that there's adequate room to put a TAV in TAV in the future for this otherwise young patient. And importantly, it's not nothing to have a pacemaker at the age of 72. This lady had no change at all in conduction. You see the same width of her QRS with a right bundle and left anterior fascicular block. But I think an important technique to have this patient leave the hospital without a device. It's important to keep in mind <laughs> the idea of future tab and tab, especially for the younger patients that you want to deploy a high valve. So this patient came also 72 years of age an annulus requiring a 29 millimeter S3. You can see here a lot of room in the sinus, but the tw uh, 29 millimeter S3 has a 22.5 millimeter frame height. And you can see here that that is going to reach the sinotubular junction if we implant the valve at zero height. And importantly, the STJ measures barely the same size as a 29 millimeter S3. So if we place this valve when this guy is 80 or 83, most likely he's going to need a tab and tab and that would sequester the sinuses. So what we do in cases like this, we still try to figure out how high we want to implant the valve in the LAO projection. You can just uh, sort of place the valve uh, so that you know you're going to avoid the left main for a future tab and tab. And then that in the REO caudal, again, this demonstrates depth. We still look at this to implant the valve. Uh, again, a slow, uh, slow deployment. And importantly, what you're gonna see is despite placing the valve a little bit lower than we usually like, it's still a reasonably high deployment. It's still sort of a 90-10 or a 80-20 kind of a deployment. And we have excellent room for future tab and tab on the LAO projection. I think the other part of, of understanding pacemaker need is how we risk stratify these patients after TAVI. 
Certainly there are a number of patients we have and they have pre-existing ECG changes. We're not sure what the post ECG means. And sometimes we may leave a pacer in place. We may monitor them in the hospital for one or two or three nights. And sometimes patients just get a pacemaker uh, and frankly, half of them aren't needing it, uh, you know, 30 days later. So this was a, a, actually a really fun study that Azim and I did together when Azim was still in Milan in uh, San Rafale. So we looked at 284 patients consecutively treated, uh, some at Cleveland Clinic, some in uh, Milan. And what we did was we withdrew the pacemaker from the right ventricle that was used for the, the TAVI, of course, to the right atrium. And then we paced the patients between 70 and 120 beats per minute from the right atrium. You can see in the right, this is a patient with a normal uh, baseline sinus rhythm. And then you see, as we start the right atrial pacing, uh, at a, uh, they, the PR starts getting longer and longer, and then they drop a beat, sort of a typical wanky back. And so, uh, as I said, we did this consecutively for patients who were not in a uh, baseline of atrial fibrillation, who did not have a complete heart block at the end of the case. So obviously we don't want to withdraw that right ventricular pacemaker and patients, of course, who didn't have a pre-existing pacemaker. So what does this pacing test mean? Uh, essentially, what we find is that if you rapidly pace and you um, from the atrium and you develop Wenckebach, that's going to happen between the uh, A and the H interval. And what that means is you, if you develop Wenckebach, you're not going to adequately sort of stress test uh, for high grade AV block in the HV interval. Okay, so that's sort of an inadequate pacing test <clears throat> as, as, you, uh, as you see here. If you have pacing induced Wenckebach, you have an incomplete assessment of the HV conduction. But if you don't have Wenckebach, you've had sort of an adequate stress test of the HV interval up to about 120 beats a minute. And what we found with this seen here on the right, is that if you don't develop Wenckebach, there is an almost negligible chance of needing a pacemaker at 30 days. In fact, there's 1.3% of patients needing a pacemaker who uh, didn't have Wenckebach. One of them was a patient who actually had a pre-planned uh, pacemaker implantation for uh, heart failure, and EP decided to put the pacemaker while they were in the hospital for TAVI. And then the second patient was a patient who just had a left bundle branch block, uh, and we were a little bit more conservative about putting a pacemaker in that patient. So really, uh, the bottom line for these patients, despite sort of pre-existing ECG findings, et cetera, is on this RA pacing test, if they didn't have Wenckebach, we feel quite comfortable to send the patient home without a device. Moving on then uh, from pacemaker risk to stroke risk after TAVI, uh, this was a, a, <coughs> a paper that one of our former fellows, Chetan Huded, who's now at Mid-America Heart, uh, wrote up uh, from the TVT registry. So this was around 100,000 patients uh, undergoing TAVI. And you can see, again, this uh, graph is presented a lot, that the, the stroke rate is relatively uh, similar, actually, over a number of years, despite uh, risk profiles and device improvements and so forth. And the, pay, the stroke rate of 2.3% is much higher than anything we're comfortable with in PCI, which is fractions of that. We know that stroke is mainly a periprocedural uh, phenomena. Um, and we know, frankly, despite all of the controversies that are surrounding the use of cerebroembolic protection, you can see in this editorial that we provided that if you take the totality of randomized trials, single center trials, patient level pooled analyses, national registry data that for the most part, you're seeing a 60 to 80% relative risk reduction that is statistically significant in all of these trials. I think, you know, certainly there were some questions in the Sentinel Pivotal trial that the uh, primary endpoint of MRI findings was not statistically significant uh, reduction. Uh, but again, that was probably just a poor endpoint. And in fact, even the clinical endpoint, which was a subgroup analysis in that trial, demonstrated a similar finding of around um, uh, 60 to 80% relative risk reduction. Nevertheless, uh, it's important to uh, qualify that the use of the Sentinel is safe. I know a lot of people have concerns about manipulations in the arch and that increasing stroke risk, things like that. There was in fact no signal uh, of uh, harm with the use of the Sentinel device compared to control in that pivotal Sentinel trial. And ultimately, uh, to, to sort of better understand some of these controversies, uh, this is why the protected uh, TAVI trial is ongoing. In fact, enrollment has just completed. Uh, this is a uh, 
an investigator initiated and led trial uh, with uh, Samir Kapadi and Axel Linke as a global PI as a study chair uh, is Marty and uh, provided, of course, grant support by Boston Scientific. And this is a really important trial because this is 3,000 patients, which is clinically powered. So all patients will have a formal neurologic exam, either by a neurologist or an advanced practitioner in neurology, randomized half and half to TAVI with, with or without the Sentinel. And then all of these patients also get a neurologic exam formally after the procedure with a primary endpoint that, again, there's a clinical one of stroke at 72 hours or discharge. Uh, the interim analysis at 2,100 patients uh, uh, suggested no harms of the, of the trial and certainly to keep going. And enrollment was just completed last week. And so I think this is going to be eagerly anticipated because truly the clinical endpoint of stroke is what both, I think, operators and patients certainly are most interested in. Facilitating peripheral bailout. I'm going to uh, caveat that this, I know many people feel this is a bit niche, but hopefully uh, I'll make an argument of why we think this is important. Uh, and this is how we frankly uh, do all of our TAVI cases here in Cleveland Clinic. So this is the idea of a unilateral uh, femoral artery access. Rather than putting the angiographic sheath and the radial artery or the contralateral artery, what have you, uh, this is how we do it. So uh, this is the micropuncture that you see uh, to get the delivery sheath access. We then use that uh, to take an angio. Of course, we want to make sure we have sucked the femoral head where we want to and so forth. We then use our, we always use a single proclose. So we then place our single proclose here uh, and then just put an eight French sheath in there so it doesn't bleed and ooze while we then get the inferior sheath access, as you see here. Usually we like this to be about uh, two centimeters at least below the delivery sheath so that there's room for us to intervene if we need to, as I'll show you in a moment. How that looks grossly, you can see here, this is eight French is gonna become the delivery sheath uh, site. This five French sheath is what we use for the angiographic uh, catheter, that straight flush in the non-coronary sinus, and also for the completion angiogram. Uh, here, of course, is the uh, pacing sheath. So everything is in the same side, eases life for the fellows when they have to hold pressure at the end of the case, they can just uh, stand on one side. So here is why this is helpful. So this is at, uh, after we did the TAVI and we pulled out the delivery, uh, the E sheath, we completed the per close and you can see that stenosis there. This is 1127 AM. Within two minutes, all you have to do is just put a wire up from uh, the sheath uh, below. Uh, and, and this is a, a six by 40 millimeter balloon. And within two minutes after that, you see this is uh, completed. To be honest, one of the most important things is that you can never have an occlusion of the CFA with this because you will always have the inferior sheath across the delivery access site. We have all spent more time opening an occluded CFA than we actually did putting in the TAVI in the first place. And you will never have that issue uh, with, with this uh, kind of a single side access. I think this is an even more beneficial strategy when you have significant CFA compromise. So this is a, a really kind of a, a morbidly obese patient. And you can see here, despite the closure, the pre-closure of the per-close, adding uh, per-close, et cetera, we have a significant bleed here. And we have all sort of hurt our own hands by having to hold pressure on this. This is 1034 AM. You can see within one minute in the middle frame here, Here's a viabon just passed up through the inferior sheath, pulling it back to the uh, to the side of the perforation, and then done. The the artery is uh, is patent and the the perforation is sealed. So I think this can be a really really helpful strategy. Uh, we did look at our experience uh, with this unilateral access uh, that was published in Jack Intervention. And the bottom line is that there was no difference in complications, whether you chose bilateral access or unilateral access uh, in terms of hematomas and so forth, uh, or you know, sort of damaging the CFA in any way by having two access points in there. So the next uh, topic uh, is valve choice uh, considerations. Again, I think all of us have our own sort of favorite valves that we default to, whether it's balloon expandable or, or self-expanding. And I think that's often great for most patients. However, uh, I think it's important to really uh, treat each patient as a unique individual. And so what are the important factors in valve choice? 
we know the valve to valve comparisons, frankly, have been limited. Uh, and so we have to take into consideration the various anatomic factors and patient related con uh, considerations like age, BMI, uh, kind of comorbid cardiac conditions. Uh, and so things that may favor a balloon expandable valve, sort of a short or narrow sinus of Valsalva to preserve the feasibility of future TAV and TAV. High grade conduction disease may favor a BEV uh, due to lower risk of pacemaker implantation. And then of course the issues surrounding uh, future P, uh, PCI and coronary reaccess. On the self-expanding side, perhaps a smaller annulus may favor a self-expanding valve with lower gradients. Uh, the risk of annular trauma with LVOT calcification, maybe that's another consideration for the self-expanding platforms. These are often, of course, not exclusive choices, and usually there are both anatomic and patient-related factors uh, that are going to play a part. So to go through some, uh, some uh, little background here, and then we'll get into case examples, <clears throat> specifically regarding future uh, TAV and TAV feasibility, I thought this is a really nice analysis uh, uh, that, was, that was done. Uh, this is uh, showing that TAVI, uh, future TAV and TAV is feasible because the valve frame is below the coronary access points. Um, again, a bit more uh, commonly seen in the balloon expandable platforms that are shorter. I know this says TAVI, uh, TAV and TAV is theoretically feasible uh, because the valve frame, uh, there's still room outside in the STJ to access the coronaries. I think truly this is a feasible scenario as well. And then clearly there's the uh, infeasible situations where the sinus is small, the sinotubular junction is short, and the valve frame, uh, once you push up the TAVI leaflets up to the side of the valve frame, will not allow a coronary reaccess and will sequester coronary flow. So if we look at how this relates, again, in patient-specific scenarios, this is a young woman. Uh, it feels like everyone we treat in Cleveland is 72, but it's true, uh, I'm not making these uh, ages up. This patient has an area, annulus area of 4.2 centimeters square, so a, a 23 millimeter S3, or a perimeter of 75 millimeters for a 29 uh, EVO uh, Pro Plus. If we look at the valve, uh, the dimensions of the valves on the left there, it's really important to understand how high the leaflets go and where, your, uh, where you'll create essentially a tube from the LVOT up to the ascending aorta. So this patient has sinuses that are reasonable in size, uh, about 32, 33 millimeters. But you can see here that the height of, a, of the leaflets, the top of the commissure in an EVO at 26 millimeters will go well into the uh, top of the uh, ascending aorta beyond the sinotubular junction. And that's really going to be not a great situation for a future TAV and TAV for a young patient. On the other hand, you can see here that 23S3 is well away from the coronary ostia. And so that's ultimately the valve uh, that we chose here. Uh, and you can see here a future TAV and TAV possibility is, is very feasible. On the other hand, this is a 67 year old lady with a BMI of 54, uh, who for a number of reasons was considered at a, at a high risk for cardiac surgery, least of which of course was her BMI. And you can see here, again, debating between a 23 millimeter S3 and, uh, and uh, Evolute uh, 29 millimeter. And what you can see here is that the sinuses are certainly adequate in size for either of those valve platforms. And if you look at, again, the height of 26 millimeters uh, that we're gonna uh, place in Evo, which we were really considering because of her BMI, and we thought that a 23 millimeter S3 would result in too high of gradients for that size, you can see here that we get just up to the STJ if we're placing the valve at a zero point. So looking specifically at the waist diameter, which is only 23, we know that if we place that below, uh, just below where the coronary ostia are, we're gonna have adequate room in the future for a tab and tab for this lady. And so that's ultimately what we did. This is a 29 millimeter pro plus. You can see a nice result there. We're about uh, four millimeters into the uh, ventricular outflow tract. And you can see here at the height of that waist diameter where the, uh, at the top of the commissures there, we're still gonna be able to access the coronaries even with a future uh, TAV and TAV. And a nice overall TAV gradient of uh, three millimeters of mercury in a patient with a BMI of 54 is you know, really a fantastic advantage of this superannular uh, self-expanding platform. It's important as we talk about hemodynamics uh, to understand how that plays out also in valve choice for valve and valve uh, procedures. 
We know that uh, smaller surgical valves tend to have worse mortality. Certainly not all of this is based on valve size alone, but hemodynamics is, certainly plays a part. And we know that generally speaking in smaller surgical valves, especially with balloon expandable valve platforms, we tend to see higher gradients than we do in the larger surgical valve sizes. But what's important to understand always is that different surgical valves of the same label size don't always mean the same thing. So on the left, you have the CE standard surgical valve of 21 millimeters, which actually has a true ID of 19 uh, versus the St. Jude Biocore, uh, which really is a very, it's a small internal diameter. It's a stiff surgical valve that sometimes fractures and sometimes does not, has a much smaller true ID. So what's really important is to just keep in mind what is a surgical uh, type of valve and how sort of fracturable is it? Because these are, of course, of course are gonna make uh, important decisions when it comes to the TAVI choice. So if we take a look, this is a relatively young patient, 69 years old, has a 21 millimeter mitral flow, which frankly is a, a very rigid valve. It doesn't fracture terribly well. It does fracture, but it has a small uh, internal diameter. You can see here that with a 23 millimeter EVO with a 26 millimeter height to the top of the commissure, again, we're gonna have plenty of room in the future uh, for TAV and TAV and not obstruct uh, his coronaries. So you can see here the valve in place, just putting the valve is not enough. You wanna make sure that you're optimizing these valve and valve results with a high pressure dilation. You can see there the frame is barely open. And then with the high pressure dilation at almost 18 to 20 atmospheres, you're gonna see in a moment, the valve fractures uh, really nicely there. And with that, we have a nice uh, gradient, certainly 12 millimeter gradient for this valve and valve uh, procedure is an excellent result for this patient. To contrast that, this is a 72-year-old woman with a small valve. It's a 21 millimeter CE paramount. And you can see here uh, with a 23 mil, uh, sorry, 20 millimeter S3 that we have room to fill the coronary for future TAV and TAV. But very clearly, placing a self-expanding prosthetic here would preclude that future TAV and TAV option. Now, what's important to know, again, remembering what kind of a surgical valve this is. The CE Paramount is a beautiful valve. It doesn't, it expands fully. There's almost no rigidity to the annular frame. So you can see here with a 20 millimeter S3 with a high pressure dilation using 20 millimeter true balloon. You can see we protected the coronary with a wire and a balloon just to make sure. You can see here clearly we're avoiding the coronary. And this is actually a three-year follow-up echo for this, a seven millimeter mean gradient at this point with only a 20 millimeter S3. So to be clear, I know a lot of people would never use a 20 millimeter or frankly, even a 23 millimeter balloon expandable valve for valve and valve. But I think it's actually a very rational thing to do as long as you have the right uh, index surgical valve platform. Um, and then discussing in a similar sort of similar ideas, the feasibility of future coronary access, again, really depends on root anatomy and valve platform. We're focusing specifically for this, not only on the commissures, but also on the skirt heights of the two uh, valve platforms. And again, from this uh, CT uh, scan based analysis, uh, looking at sort of unfavorable coronary access on, with the self-expanding platform on the left, uh, almost a third of patients and on with the balloon expandable platform on the right, about 16%. Certainly this is, uh, I wouldn't say this is a dated study, but of course there are different ways in which we can now uh, align the self-expanding platforms to have commercial, uh, achieve commercial alignment a little bit more uh, predictably. Uh, and the newer generation of valve platforms should all have better commercial alignment. But I think this is still something to consider at least in the current era. So as a case example, this is a patient who had severe aortic stenosis and also the circumflex disease and actually had both exertional dyspnea and exertional chest discomfort. We thought, frankly, that the aortic valve disease was more significant than the coronary disease. And so our idea, also because the patient was elderly and we didn't, we wanted to minimize antiplatelet therapy and so forth, if we could, we figured we would simply replace the aortic valve and then bring them back for a PCI if it was clinically indicated. You can see here, uh, again, the uh, 26 millimeter S3 would really fit nicely, not at all involve the coronary arteries. And so any future PCI would be entirely unfettered. So that was the valve that we chose. 
you can, uh, to be honest, the patient did well from an exertional dyspnea perspective, but still had exertional chest tightness that was uh, troubling them. And so we brought them back, you can see here, very easily accessed uh, left main coronary, and ultimately a good result of that circumflex PCI. So again, I think important things to consider uh, and, and truly in, in considering valve choices, it's important to also realize when you're talking about coronaries that not everyone does TAVI. And, and those of us that do TAVI may have more experience in engaging coronaries in patients that have you know, either balloon or self-expandable valve frames. That patient who shows up in the middle of the night for ST elevation MI to a non-TAVI center or to an operator that doesn't do TAVI, you know, that could be a real issue. And then uh, kind of to close out, and I think especially germane uh, to the current uh, climate of hospital care, uh, when hospitals are full, uh, caregivers unfortunately are limited. How do we reduce the post-TAVR length of stay, especially as we're doing more and more TAVI for patients? There's been a steady decline in hospital length of stay uh, as based on this TVT registry analysis. Five, six years ago, patients were staying on average almost four to five days in the hospital. The average length of stay now is about uh, two days in the hospital after TAVI. And this is certainly an evolutionary process. The earlier trials demonstrated that discharging patients at three days or less was as safe as keeping them longer. Uh, and then the 3M study that was spearheaded by the group in, uh, in Vancouver looked at 411 patients, 327 of them were discharged on the next day versus 80 of them who were discharged thereafter. There was no difference in uh, certainly adequate outcomes in both of these groups. And over the time of uh, the COVID pandemic, there have been some small case series here and there that have uh, showed perhaps the thought of same day discharge. And really uh, until now, the largest analysis was this uh, 29 patient uh, analysis from the group in Emory, where uh, these patients are discharged uh, safely the same day of their TAVI. So we actually, uh, during that same time frame uh, in March of 2020, at the start of the COVID pandemic, instituted a same day discharge uh, TAVI pathway. These were all patients who underwent transfemoral TAVI under conscious sedation. They, they were finished with an adequate uh, six hour post TAVR bed rest time for the monitoring. There are no comp major complications of the procedure as defined by annular complications, stroke, high degree uh, AV block, can complete heart block, or major vascular complications, any of which of course would have required further observation time. And the patients also had to have a post-discharge social support. They were not uh, kind of going home alone. And they also felt comfortable with the idea of a same day discharge. If all these were met after a six hour observation, uh, the primary operator and the advanced practice providers and the patients reviewed the above criteria. They were discharged before 7 p.m. on the procedure day, and they were uh, discharged with an outpatient visit, including ECG, with an advanced practice provider plan for either the post-op day one or two. To look at the workflow, again, uh, we looked at 2019 to 2020. We did 1,315 uh, TAVIs. We excluded uh, the patients who were non-TF, we excluded the two patients who died, and we of course excluded uh, any of the inpatients. We were left with 1,113 outpatient transfemoral procedures. Just under 600 of these were performed in 2019, um, at which point we did not have a same day discharge uh, uh, pathway. And of those almost 600 patients, 480 of them were discharged on the next day in 2019, about 80%. In 2020, we had 516 patients <clears throat> who had an outpatient transfemoral TAVR, uh, of whom 443 were discharged on the same or next day. And ultimately, it was that next day group there in 2020, uh, sorry, in 2019, that served as a control for our same day discharge protocol. See here, uh, again, the control group of next day discharge in 2019 versus same or next day discharge in 2020. No real difference in the age, just under 80 years. Uh, marginally less STS score, but of course there have been changes in STS score calculations over time as well. Primarily use of the balloon expandable valve platform, which is our default strategy, though we used a bit more self-expanding valves in 2020. Uh, almost all patients had uh, central cerebroembolic protection and perhaps we became a bit more efficient in 2020, completing a, a few more cases before noon than we did in 2019. What you see here is that in the 30-day outcomes, there was no difference 
uh, when you compare the groups in 2020 who had a same day discharge versus those who had a next day discharge. Um, with regard to death, pacemaker implantation, cardiovascular readmissions, or stroke. If we drill down on those a little bit more, because I know this is always an interesting point of this conversation, if we look at uh, readmissions within one week, so patients, should we have kept them longer? I would argue no. Uh, one patient came back on the next day with rapid atrial fibrillation uh, that converted spontaneously. One patient came back on the second, uh, on the first post-operative day with a fever that turned out to be just atelectasis. There were no infectious uh, issues. And one patient came back a week later with hypertensive emergency and some pulmonary edema, and they were treated with antihypertensives and diuretics. A major concern, of course, is are we missing uh, patients who need a pacemaker? Uh, again, just to remind you, there were no deaths within 30 days in the same day discharge group, so we didn't miss any sort of uh, undiagnosed conduction disease. And as far as new pacemakers that patients returned for within 30 days, the only patient that returned after a same day discharge actually came back 25 days later with an intermittent complete heart block. And that patient had absolutely no ECG changes after the TAVI. And so, you know, to be clear, any of our sort of usual risk predictors wouldn't have caused us to send, keep that patient longer. I will say parenthetically that in the same day discharge group, there were six patients who actually had a left bundle branch block immediately after valve deployment. All of those patients completely resolved that QRS change during their time of rhythm monitoring and on the post-TAVI EKG. So they were still discharged home on the same day. Those patients who did not resolve their left bundle were kept and usually observed until the next day and sent home with a Zio patch if they didn't resolve. We've continued our same day discharge pathway uh, throughout 2021. And you can see here that generally speaking, we're discharging about 25 to 30% of our patients on the same day and about uh, give or take uh, 50 to 55% of our patients on the next day. So, you know, I think a lot of the things that I've demonstrated, all the things I've demonstrated have data and published data, peer reviewed data behind them. Um, and, and so I think that these are things that are really sort of reliable and, and reproducible uh, things that we have published on. Uh, to provide sort of our three-year volume and outcomes that reflect a lot of this data, you can see in total just about uh, under 1,900 uh, patients with, you know, results that we're really, really proud of, uh, a mortality of 0.2%, a stroke rate of 0.5%, uh, significant AR of 0.4%, uh, and again, a pacemaker rate of uh, just under 2.5% you know, in a lot of patients. Uh, so to summarize, I think it's important in 2022 that we optimize TAVI for the young and the old. High valve implantation does reduce new pacemaker risk. A right atrial pacing test after valve deployment may be important for risk stratification. Embolic protection may help reduce stroke. We certainly believe that it does. And if nothing, it certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, protected TAVR is going to be an important part of the data in this arena. Single side femoral access uh, does in, uh, provide an easier opportunity for peripheral intervention, which I think is important. Valve selection should be an active and a thoughtful consideration, keeping in mind uh, coronary and root anatomy, as well as assuring the future TAV and TAV capability, especially among the younger or lower risk patients. Valve and valve TAVI does require an understanding also of the index uh, surgical valve characteristics in addition to the above. And same day discharge in appropriately selected patients is feasible and safe. So thank you very much for your time, your attention. Certainly happy to take any questions if there are. Amar, uh, as usual, it was phenomenal. Every time I hear you speak, I learn something. So thank you. And I think as usual, you know, at the clinic, you guys are always pushing the limits on how to, you know, do procedures more efficiently, safer, and your volume and outcomes are just phenomenal. So I think Thanks, you, you and Samir really set an incredibly high standard that the rest of us try and follow. Um, and um, it's, yeah, it's really phenomenal. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. It's, it, is the, it is the work of a large team. Uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Kabadi and I are a part, but uh, Rishi Puri and Grant Reed are our colleagues also and contribute heavily to these, uh, to these kind of outcomes. And of course, the anesthesia, surgical and nursing teams were all involved in the care of these patients. So thank you. Very kind words, but uh, it always takes a village, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pass it on to all our, you know, all our fellows have joined. Uh, Manaf is, 
one of our structural heart uh, attendings now is a fellow about to become an attending here. Uh, and I know he's made Chow. Yeah, it's great. So we're really lucky too that we can keep him. Um, and you didn't steal him away from us. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we'll have some, we'll take some questions from the chat. Uh, Edwin, I saw you had your hand up. Um, did you did you want to ask a question, Edwin? Um, I'll allow you to talk. I'm not sure if if you wanted to ask a question. If you do, you have that ability. Um, so let's start. I mean, I'm going to go with Ms. Samina. Why don't you start? Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for the great talk. I learned so much uh, uh, from your talk. Um, I have a few questions uh, about the uh, high deployment of the sapien valve that you described uh, very nice, uh, nicely. Um, one is that um, um, in your follow-up in this population of patients, did you notice any problem in your experience with the effective orifice area and patient prosthetic mismatch when you deploy the valve higher? And then the second question, was there any issue with the coronary access later on with the sapien valve? Yeah, so good questions both. Uh, to be honest, there was a marginally, marginally lower gradient in the high deployment uh, technique valve. Maybe, you know, the maybe the area of the valve cooptation just opens slightly larger when it's higher and not as constrained by the annulus, especially for the balloon expandable platform. So that wasn't an issue. Uh, and kind of as I had demonstrated in the... Um, in the CT analysis, we're very, we're very prescriptive about the patients that we decide not to place a, a valve at a you know 100 zero if they're somewhat younger, lower risk, what have you, and we worry that we'll preclude the future TAV and TAV option or or create problems with coronary reaccess. Now, if someone is 89 years old and they have conduction disease, and placing the valve at 100 zero will preclude future TAV and TAV we'll still probably place it at that height because we're less worried about future tab and tab and we're more worried about you know, having them leave with a pacemaker. So again, I think there are probably risks and benefit analysis there, um, but certainly nothing that thankfully we haven't had uh, encountered as a problem that, that you suggested yet. Thank you. And my other question was about the protected tower study. Um, the definition of a stroke is just clinical or they included the imaging as well, because sometimes these patients don't have symptoms uh, immediately, but they have changes in their MRI. And uh, was that something that they um, in included in the study? Yeah, so the, the MRI outcome uh, has been an outcome in other studies like Clean Tavi, you know, the outcome in the Sentinel Pivotal trial. Um, you know, unfortunately, frankly, MRI outcomes are very difficult to truly uh, accurately quantify because whether it's on T1 or T2 based imaging, uh, whether it's based on flare imaging, which is really what shows later scar, or, you know, and, and maybe a true sort of infarct versus not, these are all hard things to control for the time at which you obtain that MRI. And ultimately, 100% of people will have MRI based emboli. And, and that's a hard thing to really rationalize to say, is it prognostically important? Because spontaneous infarct is that you find on MRI, and this is in the dementia literature, is clearly important. But it's hard to know that one procedural, you know, silent infarct has the same prognostic implication that recurrent, uh, you know, silent embolic infarcts may have. So for all of these limitations, this is strictly a clinically powered uh, endpoint trial. It's, but it's not just you know me doing a TAVI and saying, I don't think they have a stroke. It is a neurology professional, whether it's a neurology attending or a neurology nurse practitioner or PA, examines all of these patients before and after. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks, Samina. Andrea? Hi. Thank you again for this great talk. I wanted to ask you about the same day discharge protocol. Um, sure. If I understood well, uh, other than the protocol that you showed, you considered also conduction disturbances like left bundle branch. Um, that this in, uh, did this impact on the patient profile between the two groups? Were there any differences, uh, especially about pacemaker implantations or something like that? Yeah, so there, there actually were no significant differences in the need for pacemaker implantation, whether it was in the same day or the next day discharge group. 
Um, there was a higher uh, number of patients in the next day discharge who had a uh, persistent left bundle branch block, however, which is why we kept them, you know, for monitoring for one day uh, longer. Um, and, and so specifically, we looked only at same day or next day discharge as the comparator groups, certainly in patients who had high grade, you know, whether it's complete heart block or, you know, things of that nature, uh, or some kind of procedural complication, they may have stayed for even longer. So the idea of this study was simply to say that in a, in, based in the selection criteria that we chose, was it safe to discharge those patients or even using those selection criteria, would we somehow miss things and these patients were coming back, you know, within a week for cardiovascular readmission or we were missing, you know, conduction abnormalities that patients would come back for. And we were quite, of course, reassured by the data that it's an okay thing to do. And, and frankly, it's been important for us because in the current time, you know, we're trying to minimize any procedures that require an inpatient hospital bed. So we're trying to, you know, outside of inpatient tabbies we do, we're trying to only do two outpatient tabbies a day because we know we'll finish those by noon and those patients will go home and they won't require a bed. So it's been, an, frankly, it's been a really important thing just for us to continue our, our, our TAVI practice and take care of these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Thank you, Doctor. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Okay, technical issues. So, uh, thank you so much. Um, great talk. Um, you, nice to see you again. Um, we we met at TVT. You uh, you, you had a wonderful presentation on that acute uh, RV collapse. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Pella case. Yeah. No, it's beautifully guide, beautifully uh, presented program. and beautifully done. Thanks. Um, so, um, a few questions. Um, really impressive pacemaker rate that you guys have. I was just wondering if you look at all at the uh, membranous um, septum length on your CT, is that a part of your routine assessment? So it, in truth, it is not. Um, and, and, you know, I think in many ways, that is the benefit of this technique of uh, not only implanting the valve high, but just kind of isolating the, in the REO caudal projection, the non-coronary sinus and squaring off the valve and sort of that sort of the how-to of that technique, because it's very easy and very reproducible, right? I mean, we all, we all like to look at the CAT scan and analyze everything on our own, but of those different analytics, I find the membranous septum is sometimes the most confusing to really be very clear about what is the depth of that membranous septum, um, and am I looking at it, or am I, is it slightly thin, is it slightly thicker, am I not still in the membranous septum? And so this completely takes that sort of variability out of it. Thank you. And actually, that leads into my next question. Um, you know, I noticed that you you're, you focus on squaring off the valve uh, in the REO caudal projection. I, I noticed that sometimes the undeployed valve and the, the annulus are often not in the same plane. So are you worried about losing the, the coplanar um, projection on the annulus when you square off the valve? Or are you just really focusing on that corner of the of the of the non coronary cusp, the most uh, left side of that of the the aorta at that. Yeah, no, really good question. So, so the short answer is no. I'm not I'm not worried about losing the coplanar uh, coplanarity, I guess, of the the native valve, um, and it's really just that corner, that bottom corner of the non coronary cusp, uh, that's isolated by the straight flush catheter, and and. We like the straight flush for two reasons. One, it's just a point right down there. So you're really targeting that point. Uh, and also because we're leaving that catheter there throughout the valve deployment, there's no worry of kind of sequestering the pigtail catheter in there. Uh, you know, maybe it's a small sinus, maybe it's a small STJ. You're always going to pull out, be able to pull out a straight flush. Uh, and even when you square off the valve, you will notice sometimes it doesn't, when it's in a full balloon deployment, it's not totally squared off at the end and maybe a little bit this way or that way off. But as long as you're hitting the corner with the bottom of the valve at the non-coronary cusp, you know you've got coverage at the level of the annulus. That's great technique, thank you. Yeah, Amar, so, you know, you just gave me, you created headaches for me because I already have an issue with Manaf because he's always trying to implant, implant the valve higher and higher. <laughs> and I'm just waiting for the day when he plants it too high. And now that he sees you going for like, Zero hundred. He thinks now he has to do that every time. 
I appreciate no that, such Albert. thing as too high. No such <laughs> thing as too high. I will tell you, I still, you know, and in, in truth, right, we had, so the one valve embolization that we had um, in the high deployment technique in, truly had nothing to do with the high deployment. I still remember it. it was a case I did in June of, it was Grant's last week of his fellowship before he started on staff. It was like seven o'clock on a Wednesday. And this patient had like one plus AR. And I thought, you know, we should just post still it and just feel good about it. And the pacemaker just completely lost capture, of course, as a balloon was fully up and just literally one, one cardiac cycle. And the thing was in the ascending aorta. And, you know, we did the thing that we always do, right? We pulled it into the arch and put a Palmas stent on a ZMED balloon and put it there and then put a new Tavi and it was fine. But, it, you know, it's very difficult for me to say that was, you know, the result of the high deployment technique. It's just that the pacemaker, unfortunately, lost its capture. So if nothing, that 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 case taught me not to implant the valve lower, but simply to be a lot more, uh, you know, uh, clear that the pacemaker is doing what it needs to do. Yep. There's, before we go to Nicholas, there's a question here from Felipe about, you know, we, we, there's all these new implantation techniques, you know, whether yep. it's, you know, using LAO, RAO, CUSP overlap, but it seems, and I think you're right, Felipe, it's all about um, trying to get higher, but it's not, I think, just about trying to get higher, Amr. It's also about knowing where you implant the valve, right? Yeah. We all want to get higher, but, you know, you need to know where you implant the valve and whether it's cusp, whether you call it cusp overlap or the double S curve or just the way yeah. you guys do it, which is, you know, go REO and then go caudal until your valve is in plane. It's really about just having that precision. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree completely. And, and I think, you know, the, one of the keys here is that, at least in our opinion, is that what sometimes hurts you about the LAO is that you're a little bit foreshortened, right? Between what is the aortic root, what is the annulus, what is the LVOT? And so sometimes what you think is the depth in a totally LAO kind of a view, you find is not accurately the depth when you look either in PA caudal, aria caudal, whatever. And so I think that's the only caution that I have, but I think they're all, you know, ultimately aiming at the same at the same fact which is what really understanding the depth and i think especially for the fellows just spend time between cases sitting with a cat scan and spinning it around from rao caudal to lao cranial and really looking at what would be your fluoroscopic view and understanding where that you know exactly this idea of why is the lao cranial why is that foreshortening that entire sort of annular area right and and having understanding like that is is i think uh, you know, imperative. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I do think that the LAO projection is helpful when you're using the balloon expandable valve. And as I showed in that one case, making sure you're underneath the left coronary uh, plane, if you need to be. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the self-expanding platform, you know, you're going to, you're going to first hit the, the non-coronary side, but you want to see where you're projecting out underneath the left coronary sinus and are you too deep or are you going to pop out or what have you so we have the luxury of a, of a biplane imaging in our room so we can have our eyesight on on both of those things at the same time but you know maybe it just means moving the camera a little bit if necessary but um, you know it was a really nice uh, the paper that Lars wrote earlier uh, Sundergaard earlier this year on how to optimize the commissural alignment and if you look in that paper, all three of those valve platforms, uh, accurate platform, Evo platform, and portico platform, all really used essentially an REO caudal kind of uh, cusp overlap or cusp isolation view in order to provide the commissural alignment. Great. Nikos? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your uh, great presentation. Um, I had a question about the single side uh, access, femoral access. Um, uh, what would be your cutoff for like vessel size to use that access and degree of calcification? And then, sure. uh, what, what do you think the I know the paper did not compare with radial secondary access, but what do you think the comparison would be? Yeah, uh, th thanks, Nico. So, in truth, we don't really have a, a threshold to say this vessel is too small. Uh, we're not, you know, we're barely going to fit the TAVI sheath. We're not going to do same side access. And and so we'll always try it with same side access. And the, the reason for that, quite frankly, is I feel like in those patients that have such a crappy iliofemoral access that we're worried about passing the sheath, 
Those are also the patients where you're likely to have a vascular complication, whether it's a dissection you need to balloon, whether it's a perforation, whatever it is. And so having the same side access, even if we don't pass the straight flush catheter there, just having the CFA access in the same side, in my opinion, makes life easier. So I will always put the access there and then put the straight flush and then try to pass the sheath. And if I can't pass the sheath and I balloon and this and that and the other, and I still can't pass the sheath, the last thing I'll do is take out the angiographic, uh, the straight flush catheter, put the sheath and you know, and put the straight flush from the other side. We don't tend to use the radial access as a secondary access. I know that's a, a really, uh, you know, it, it's a really easy and a default pattern for a lot of uh, operators. And I think it's great. I personally don't like it because ergonomically it gets difficult in prepping the patient. And then if you have to do a peripheral intervention, just leaning over is always annoying. But also coming from the left wrist to go down to the right groin, sometimes the length of equipment that you want in the periphery isn't always available readily. Thank you. Thanks, Nikos. So um, before we let you go, Amr, there's a few great questions from Luis uh, on the chat. And I wonder if we could address some of them because I thought they were really good. Um, the one is about pacing through the wire, right? As you yeah. know, many of our colleagues in Europe are doing it now routinely, uh, pacing through the wire. Uh, and they do it both for self-expandable and balloon expandable valves. Uh, at the clinic, are you guys pacing over the wire? So we pace over the wire for our tricuspid valve and valve implants for, you know, obvious logistic reasons. And we've not had an issue, but we also feel like, you know, there's less to lose if you, if you lose pacing capture there, right? Um, in, in mitral valve and valve and in TAVI, we always place another device. If they have an inbuilt pacemaker, then we use that, which is easy. Um, but we haven't taken the pacing from the wire. I think part of it is, we don't use any of the preformed wires like Confida or, well, we use Confida for the uh, Evo platform, but we don't use Safari or Confida for all the other valves. And so I think because we just curve our own amplats extra stiff, we have a little bit of worry that is that going to be as secure of a, of a pacing mm -hmm. option as one of these self-formed uh, wires with so many loops. Um, but, you know, I know there's, there's certainly folks out there that, that, uh, are, you know, have drank the Kool-Aid of always pacing from the wire. And it seems to be very effective. Um, I don't know. What do you guys do? Yeah, we, I guess, similar. I mean, we, we, you know, I have no issue pacing over the wire. I even do it in coronaries when I'm doing, for example, wow. now when I do a rotor of the right, I don't put a wire in. I pace over the rotor wire if I need to pace. Ah, I just make sure cool. the rotor wire is in a branch. Uh, so, you know, I get it as distal as possible. Um, we'll pace over the wire when we're doing tricuspid valves like Evoke or uh, Intrepid. Uh, if we're concerned about pacing, about patient going to heart block, we'll put a wire in the LV and pace, and it's worked fine, I have to say. Our BAVs, standalone BAVs, which we rarely do, but sometimes as a standalone BAV, uh, we'll pace over the wire for those, for example. But I still, yeah, I'm still a little bit uncomfortable with balloon expandable valves, even though we use pre-shaped wires. Um, you know, I'm, um, I don't know. I'm a little bit uncomfortable still. I, yeah. I haven't completely uh, changed or adap adopted yet, even though yeah. I've got to say, you know, you speak to Didier and you speak to Nicholas and a lot of our friends from Europe, Darren, they're all doing it all the time. And they say they've not had issues uh, at all, but they, they, yeah, they love it and they love it reliably. Right. It's yeah. not like, Oh, but I had this one bad time. Like it's universally beloved, but I don't know. It freaks me out. And maybe, <laughs> you know, we use so many balloon expandable valves that maybe if I practiced more on the self expanding to pace from the wire, maybe I would, you know, overcome that sort of activation energy, but between the balloon expandable valve and wanting to place it so high, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever cross that threshold. All right, all right. Um, so Luis also said, um, I, he has got great questions and I'm gonna address two more if you don't mind. Of course. Um, what's your technique for bicuspids with balloon expandable? Do you use the same ARIO um, cordal? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, uh, if I had extra time, uh, I would <clears throat> just show a CT scan to be clear, but I think it's especially important uh, in the bicuspid cases because 
so many times, right? Most commonly the fused rafe is between right and left. And so the non-coronary sinus or leaflet, however you want to call it, is this really large and very deep sinus. And honestly, I think that a lot of the pitfall in bicuspid TAVI and why sometimes there might be a higher PVL rate is that if, if you don't pay attention to the fact that this non-coronary sinus is in fact so much lower, that a lot of times you end up implanting the valve too low and then you don't have the proper ceiling skirt height in the anterior sinus or the left sinus, again, however you want to define it. So what I like in, in the bicuspids is if you look at that RAO caudal view, and you implant the valve not only based on the height there in the non-coronary sinus, but making sure that if you're placing it at zero or whatever, you're having an adequate coverage in the anterior aspect of that sinus in terms of the skirt height. I think you, you might actually find that in bicuspids, we sometimes end up placing not at zero. We actually end up placing you know, at a negative number, if you will, or almost above where that non-coronary sinus uh, nadir is in order to appropriately seal on the other side. And so uh, we use the same technique, but sometimes, frankly, we end up higher. Okay. Um, and then Louise asked, uh, in 2022, um, are there patients or what kind of patient would be rejected for surgical AVR, but is also not a candidate for TAVA? Is there such a thing? You know, we always you know, I think sometimes, right, we have to, there are so many things we can learn from one another. And I think sometimes, what we have to learn from our surgical colleagues is when to say no, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, as interventionalists, we grow up in this environment where so many of the patients we see are the surgical turndowns. They were turned down, not only for anatomic reasons, but they were turned down because of clinical reasons. And we don't think the patient will do well with surgery or whatever. And we feel like these, you know, we have to be these saviors that come in and provide an option. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important. Um, and I'm not just talking about healthcare resources and, you know, outcome reporting and things like that. But I mean, truly for the sake of, of, of patients and, and goals of care, I think we need to have really frank conversations about what is, you know, what are the risks of these procedures, right? I mean, the typical patient that gets rejected for surgery is the 85 year old that has a porcelain aorta and a horribly calcified annulus and also severe mitral valve stenosis with a small LV cavity, right? That patient gets rejected every time appropriately. And then we feel bad to say, well, I can't fix your mitral valve because your LV neo LVOT is too small. I, you know, you're gonna have a high risk with the surgic with a TAVI either for PVL or annular trauma or whatever. Is this what you really want? Or do you want to take the next six months and spend the time with your family and your friends rather than being in an intensive care unit, right? I think we just have to be better about having those frank conversations where we don't offer everyone everything. And that's my, I know it's a soapbox, but I think that doesn't happen often enough for all of us. Absolutely. I think it's a great place to end. Um, Amr, that was again, awesome. We learned so much. I'm going to be under so much pressure now from Manaf and Samina to go higher and higher. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm uh, but really it was a fantastic yeah. session. I, I really learned a lot and I'm sure all of us did. Thank you. Hi, I look forward to seeing you soon, my friend. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thanks okay. again for the opportunity. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Ciao, ciao.